Autonomic nervous system drugs. Okay, quick review on the parasympathetic and sympathetic, which are branches of the autonomic nervous system. Rest and digest is parasympathetic, so more active during rest and digest. Things like increase gut motility. What is it gonna to do to the heart? It's gonna decrease heart rate. Sympathetic is fight or flight. So increased heart rate and force of contraction, bronchodilation, medriasis or pupillary dilation. You can go through and review some of those actions. ANS fundamental figure talking about how effectors innervated by the autonomic nervous system are innervated a little bit differently by sympathetic and parasympathetic. So sympathetic cholinergic neuron is preganglionic. Postganglionic is adrenergic, makes and releases norepinephrine onto the receptors alpha or beta, which are the effectors innervated by the sympathetic. Parasympathetic has a longer preganglionic, which is also cholinergic. Postganglionic, as opposed to the sympathetic, is cholinergic, makes and releases acetylcholine onto muscarinic receptors located on effectors. And these effectors are innervated by the parasympathetic. Okay, sympathetic nervous system drugs. So this represents different indications, different things that they do related to alpha agonist, or alpha antagonist or beta agonist or beta antagonist. We'll go through these, but first let's review that there are subtypes of alpha and beta. Remember that if it has a odd number, it's gonna be stimulatory usually even number, usually inhibitory. And one receptor dominates in a tissue. So the predominant adrenergic receptor located in the heart, this could be the cardiac myocytes or the autorhythmic cells is beta one. Now, knowing that this one is odd, what do you think that activating with an agonist, beta one agonist would do to heart rate and force of contraction. Knowing that it's, it's an odd number and this is stimulatory, it's gonna increase heart rate and force of contraction. Predominant adrenergic for the airways, smooth muscle of the air, airways for the lungs is beta two. So that's gonna cause bronchodilation, smooth muscle relaxation. And then it's gonna be alpha one, on the vessels. That's in, that's, again, that's an odd number. So that's going to cause smooth muscle contraction and vasoconstriction. The reason we mention these, you need to memorize beta one for the heart, beta two for the smooth muscles lining the airways, alpha one for the smooth muscles for the vessels, because there's a lot of clinical relevance to this. And as we go through here, you'll see that. Let's begin with the eye. Intrinsic muscles of the eye are those that are involuntarily controlled. You don't have control over it. So this is gonna be the iris and the ciliary body muscle. Now the ciliary body muscle will control the shape of the lens. The lens will be different shape depending on near vision or far vision. The other one is going to be, the other intrinsic muscle of the eye is going to be the muscles of the iris, which regulate how much light will come in by controlling the diameter of the pupil. So the ciliary body muscle, here it is right here. This muscle is gonna have beta two receptors. So if it gets stimulated, it's going to relax. When it relaxes, 
it will move away from the lens, farther away from the lens. So it's going to move this way, making the tension in the suspensory ligaments high. High tension. Pulling on the lens, making it flat. It's going to be this shape. Flat will cause less refraction of the light, less convergence of the light. And this is necessary for distant vision. The, the, the light rays are coming in more parallel for distant vision, so they don't have to be bent as much to get a clear upside down image on the retina. As far as the iris goes, there's a couple of muscles oriented differently. So here you have the sphincter pupillae. And these would have muscarinic receptors on them, innervated by the parasympathetic. When these contract, it will cause meiosis or pupillary constriction. And in opposition to these, you have radial muscles. We go this way. These are called dilator pupillae. And these would have alpha one. So sympathetic innervation, and this would cause pupillary dilation. So how do you remember that? If a bear is chasing you, that's gonna be sympathetic. Would you like a lot of light to come in so you can see the bear that's chasing you? Yes. So dilator pupillae, alpha one. Okay, alpha two receptors. Now we should have probably mentioned here that there are little cells these are called the ciliary process epithelial cells. Ciliary process epithelial cells. These make aqueous humor, which is this liquid, aqueous means watery, and it will be produced. It will come into the posterior chamber and then travel through the pupil and then drain out through the canal of Schlem. And these cells will have beta-1 receptors. So if you stimulate that, you produce, increase the production of aqueous humor. Okay, our first medication is bromonidine, alpha-GAN-P. This is an eye drop that can be used in the treatment of glaucoma. It's an alpha-2 agonist. Okay, when you stimulate alpha-2, alpha-2 is an autoreceptor. Notice its location is not on the effector, but it's presynaptic. It's on the axon terminal of the postganglionic fiber of the sympathetic. So when you activate it, when you activate it, it will decrease norepinephrine release. So imagine this alpha-2 agonist coming and binding to the receptor, causing a decrease in norepinephrine release, less norepinephrine, decreased norepinephrine will stimulate the beta-1 receptor located on the ciliary process epithelial cells that we've showed you over here. You're gonna stimulate them less, less stimulation of beta receptor, less production of aqueous humor, so it will decrease intraocular pressure. Glaucoma is increased intraocular pressure. We wanna decrease it. So typically if it get, gets above, it varies depending on what, depending on the optometrist, but if, especially if it's above 21, not, not even always, but if it's higher, a healthy individual, it's going to be 15 or less in that, in that range. But if it gets excessively high, it can do damage to the optic nerve. So we want to keep that low. So bromonidine alpha-GAN-P is an alpha-2 agonist. will stimulate the alpha-2 receptor, which is presynaptic, lessening the release of norepinephrine, 
which means less stimulation of the beta-1 receptor, which will cause decreased aqueous humor production, which can be used in the treatment of glaucoma to lower intraocular pressure. Here's a summary of some of those receptors we mentioned. If you'd like to take a look at that, we've mentioned all of these different receptors, except for the ciliary body muscle contraction. Now, if we went back here, and if we put, there's also muscarinic on here, they'll have the opposite effect. So when this is stimulated by parasympathetic, it's gonna cause ciliary body muscle contraction, which will move closer, cause the ciliary body to move closer, decreasing the tension, decrease tension, which will not pull on, not apply any force to the lens, causing it to go to its resting state, which is spherical. And that is necessary, this biconvex spherical structure of the lens is necessary to bend the light more. This is for close-up vision. So if you're reading a book, the light rays are, are diverging a little bit. Because they're diverging, we need to bend the light rays more to get a clear image on the retina. Thus, we have to have a biconvex lens to bend the light rays more. Okay, so review the summary of those different receptors. Okay, next we have vasopressors. Okay, these are gonna be alpha-1 agonist and beta-1 agonist are examples. We also have here vasopressin, another name for ADH, antidiuretic hormone released from the posterior pituitary. Vasopressin, just break down the word, vaso, meaning vessel, presser means to cause vasoconstriction. Okay, there are V1 receptors on the vessels. If that gets activated by vasopressin, it's gonna cause vasoconstriction and an increase in blood pressure. V2 receptors in the kidney will retain water to increase blood volume, which will also increase blood pressure. So you could say that all of these are gonna increase blood pressure, these vasopressors. These will increase blood pressure. So what might they be used for? Let's take a look. The prototypical alpha-1 agonist is going, it's an alpha adrenergic, okay, alpha adrenergic. Alpha adrenergic means alpha-1 agonist. Alpha-1 agonist. Remember we said that the predominant adrenergic receptor located on the vessels is alpha-1. If you stimulate that, you're gonna cause vasoconstriction. Norepinephrine is a prototype vasopressor, activates alpha receptors more than beta receptors. So its greatest activity is in the vessels to cause vasoconstriction. Remember the beta receptors in the heart. Okay, so it's gonna increase blood pressure so it can be used for certain types of shock and hypotension. Vasoconstriction. Side effects, if you excessively stimulate alpha in other areas of the body, then you can get constipation and decrease urine output. What would it do to the pupil? We just went over that. There are alpha receptors located on the dilator pupillae. When you activate that, it causes smooth muscle contraction of those muscle cells to cause my midriasis, which is pupillary dilation. Midriasis. Okay, norepinephrine. Now, if they administer this in a peripheral line, so it looks like they didn't get all of this. Here's the needle coming in. Looks like they didn't get all of it. A little bit, this here's the vein. And a little bit is going, some of this is going into the extravascular space. So extra, vaso means vessel. Outside, a space outside the vessel, into the tissue. Now there are little vessels here that feed this tissue, right? And there's alpha-1 receptors on these little vessels. 
And if the norepinephrine binds to that, it's an alpha-1 agonist, it's going to cause vasoconstriction. And if you vasoconstrict those vessels, you're going to decrease the blood supply to the tissue. And if you get ischemia, hypoxia, you could get necrosis. And if it's bad enough, you could get gangrene. So usually they'll administer this through a central line to decrease the risk for extravasation. In a central line, you're giving it into the vessels, the big vessels near the heart. You have to thread it up there. So usually it's given in a central line. Now there is an antidote. You can infiltrate normal saline to wash it out and also administer pentolamine. What do you think it is? Well, if it's an antidote, it probably does the opposite. So this one is an alpha-1 antagonist. Pentolamine is an alpha-1 antagonist. Okay, epinephrine, given IV. So given IV, we need to review our mean arterial pressure equation, cardiac output. So our blood pressure is determined by cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance or peripheral resistance. This can be broken down into heart rate multiplied by stroke volume or force of contraction. Systemic vascular resistance would be the length of the vessel multiplied by the viscosity of the blood. All over R to the fourth power, which R is the radius of the vessel. So SVR is inversely proportional to the radius of the vessel, which means as the radius goes up, you're going to decrease systemic vascular resistance. As the radius goes down, as with vasoconstriction, you increase systemic vascular resistance. So remember that epinephrine is going to work on heart rate, stroke volume, and radius because it's working on beta and alpha. Alpha is going to be the radius because that's vasoconstriction. Heart rate and stroke volume are going to be beta because that's going to be the predominant adrenergic receptor located on the autorhythmic cells of the heart, as well as on the cardiac myocytes to increase stroke volume or force of contraction. Okay, notice that the low dose is predominantly beta that it activates. And that's in opposition to norepinephrine, which was mostly alpha. Okay, so because it can increase heart rate force of contraction, cardiac arrest, anaphylactic shock, with, with shock you have hypotension, so it's gonna increase heart rate, stroke volume, and vasoconstriction, all to increase blood pressure. Asthma, because it also activates beta two. Activating beta two, will open up the airways, cause bronchodilation. Okay, there are also beta-1 receptors in the kidney for renin release. You know that the RAS, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, everything it does will be to increase blood pressure. So it also works through the kidney to increase renin, to increase angiotensin-2, which has a lot of effects that we'll review later when we get to blood pressure. Causes bronchodilation, as we mentioned, by beta-2 stimulation. Okay, similar to alpha-1 side effects due to the alpha-1 agonist activity. Okay, epinephrine, there's an EpiPen drug of choice for anaphylactic shock. You give this IM right, through, right in the thigh. Vastus medialis into the big muscles in there, in the thigh. What would be a person's allergy? It's not gonna be to pollen. These are gonna be severe allergies. What could cause a severe allergy? Maybe the number one is peanut allergy. So if an individual has a severe peanut allergy, they may have to carry around an EpiPen. Could, other, could be other tree, could be tree nuts as well, but mostly peanuts is gonna be and then could also be bee stings. If you're allergic to that, you may be carrying around an EpiPen. Also shellfish allergy. Okay, what is the big deal with, what, what's causing this uh, big problem that could kill you? 
histamine in massive amounts released throughout the body. This would be a type one hypersensitivity reaction. And this could lead to anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic be referring to the allergies, shock, low blood pressure. How does histamine cause you, how, what could be the problem with that? Well, histamine causes a lot of vasodilation. This is going to lower your blood pressure. You could have severe lowering of the blood pressure. Also, endothelial retraction. Now your endothelial cells that line your vessels are normally close together, but with histamine, it's gonna make them gappy, allowing blood proteins like albumin to come into the extravascular space around the tissues. This albumin is gonna draw in a lot of water. And it's gonna give you edema. So there's a lot of edema. How could that kill you? Laryngoedema, edema around your airway okay, is, is, uh, can be very serious. Compromises your ability to breathe. Okay, what else does histamine do? It causes bronchoconstriction. Makes it harder to breathe. Bronchoconstriction. Bronchoconstriction. Constriction is going to close down your airways so you can't ventilate. You can't exhale and inhale as readily. Can't get the air in. Okay, and this could um, contribute to death. So histamine is doing a, have, causing a lot of problems here. So why is epinephrine the drug of choice? Well, what does it do to blood pressure? It increases heart rate, force of contraction to increase BP. It will also cause vasoconstriction to also increase blood pressure increase BP in multiple ways. So it takes care of that one. What about the edema? It's gonna, it's gonna make it, the vasoconstricted state makes it so the vessels are less leaky. And you know that it will also, we said that the epinephrine also works on beta, beta two, to cause bronchodilation. So it's gonna take care of all of the problems. Okay, so that's why it's the drug of choice, DOC, for anaphylactic shock. There's also a primatine mist that's available over the counter, OTC, you, that is available without a prescription. This one can be used to activate beta 2 to cause bronchodilation. Now, if, if you take this a lot, it's going to also activate beta one and increase your heart rate. So not, not the best to use, to use all the time because it's gonna cause tachycardia. Okay, review this. Epinephrine on the following organs, heart. We mentioned beta one. And we mentioned increased heart rate, increased force. Lungs, beta two. And that's gonna cause smooth muscle relaxation, which is bronchodilation. Vessels, remember we said that's alpha one to cause vasoconstriction. Next vasopressor is dobutamine. Dobutamine activates beta one more than beta two. This is gonna increase cardiac output. But notice it does do, does do some beta two. Now, if we have a vessel, we did say the predominant adrenergic receptor located on the smooth muscles lining the vessels was alpha one, but there's also some beta twos. Activating alpha one causes vasoconstriction. Activating beta two on the vessels will cause vasodilation. So if you have a patient that is, also, that is already hypotensive, 
then that activation of the beta-2 could make them more hypotensive. So you have to use it on patients that don't have significant hypotension for that reason. Next vasopressor is dopamine. Dopamine is a different drug depending on the dose. It will activate all the receptors, but at different doses. So a low dose of dopamine will activate the D1 receptor, the dopamine 1 receptor, and this will cause vasodilation. When would that ever be done? Well, sometimes if you vasodilated the cerebral vessels, that could increase the blood flow to the brain. The kidney, if you, cut, if you can dilate the renal artery, that can give you increased blood flow to the kidney. So in certain shock states, when your vital organs are not receiving adequate amounts of blood, then sometimes they could potentially give this. Now it's not, it has fallen out of favor somewhat, the dopamine. They do prefer norepinephrine, okay, for, for shock states. Moderate dose know that it's gonna be the beta one receptor to increase cardiac output, increase heart rate and stroke volume. And then at the highest doses, it's gonna be alpha one to cause vasoconstriction and increase systemic vascular resistance. So you should know the main receptor it's going to activate at the different doses. Decongestants, okay? This is also related to, these are alpha one agonists. Even by different routes. Visine is gonna be an eye drop. You can also have an eye drop to cause medriasis or to dilate the pupil to midriatic. Okay, all of these are alpha-1. Phenylephrine, this is a nasal spray. What would be the reason for this? You're very congested, right? There's a lot of vessels, lots of vessels related to the mucous membranes. Mucus is mostly made of water. If you want to make mucus, where do you get the water from? From the blood supply. If you can cut off the blood supply by causing vasoconstriction. Remember, an alpha-1 agonist will cause vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction will decrease the amount of water to dry up the mucus, decrease mucus production with an alpha-1 agonist. Now, you don't want to use these too long or you can get rebound congestion. Maximum is going to be about seven days that you want to use one of these. Rebound. This might be on a later slide, but re rebound congestion. So don't abuse these too long. Okay, watch out also for spilling over into systemic. Remember, these are alpha-1 agonists. Alpha-1 agonist can spill over. And this would tend to increase blood pressure, right? By causing vasoconstriction. Now also, just know that alpha-1 agonist is gonna act like sympathetic. There are alpha-1 receptors in your liver. And if you activate that from a fight or flight response, that's gonna increase your blood, blood sugar. Okay, so blood sugar or blood glucose will increase with an alpha-1 agonist. It's kind of acting like epinephrine would with a fight or flight response. Fight or flight response, you're under stress. You're gonna need a lot of blood sugar for your brain. Okay, so just know that if you mimic that effect with an alpha-1 agonist, you're gonna increase blood glucose. You have a diabetic patient taking insulin, would you have to increase or decrease the insulin dose? You may have to increase it a little bit, but these typically are given by the ocular or nasal route, so they don't go into sy uh, sy uh, systemic circulation very much. It'd be more related to the decongestants that are oral that go systemic. It would cause the most significant increase in blood glucose. Okay, now BPH, so if you have the bladder and then you have the urethra, and the prostate, the urethra runs through the prostate. 
as a male gets older, this, this um, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, this growing prostate can impede the flow of urine. Okay, so activating the alpha-1 receptors will actually cause the urethra to constrict even more and to constrict the sphincters. So it actually makes it even more difficult for a male to urinate. So be careful of that. Knowing that, one of our later drug classes is an alpha-1 antagonist, which is actually used to help with the urine flow for a patient with BPH. So the opposite effect is gonna help. Okay, here are some pictures of the ocular decongestants and the AK dilate, which is a midriatic. <clears throat> Be careful with systemic, okay? We talked about those systemic side effects. Phenylephrine, this is that nasal spray. Rebound congestion, here it is. Don't use longer than seven days. So less than seven days. Rhinitis medicamentosa. Just think of it as a, your body's negative feedback. It'll do the opposite. You're trying to block the amount of blood that gets to the mucous membranes. There are negative feedback mechanisms that kick in that will increase the amount that comes. So you get really congested. Okay, now moving on to beta-2 selective agonists. Okay, these, you gotta know albuterol, it's the main one. This is called the rescue inhaler. So if you're having an acute asthmatic attack, and when we get to the drugs used for asthma in a later, later uh, lecture, we'll be talking about these in detail, but also terbutaline could be another one of these. If they're short acting, they're called a SABA, short acting beta agonist. Okay, so these are used to open up the airways. Remember the predominant adrenergic receptor located on the smooth muscles lining the airways is beta two. If we activate that with an agonist, we're gonna open it up. We're gonna cause relaxation. Even number is inhibitory, relaxation. A terbutaline used to be used more but now its second line is a tocolytic, something that relaxes the uterine contractions. So the uterus also has smooth muscles, it's gonna relax that. So for premature contractions, they can give a beta-2 agonist that's gonna relax the uterine muscles so they don't contract. So this is this individual is having premature contractions, they can use it for that. But some of it does, does spill over and it's not completely, not completely selective for beta two. And it can cause activation of the beta one in the fetus. And you can get fetal tachycardia, which is not desirable. That's why it's second line not used as often. Usually they'll use nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. Okay, some newer drugs, Mirabegron, Merbetric. This one is a beta-3 agonist. Now, knowing it's a odd number, you would think it's stimulatory, but this is the exception to the rule. The exception to the rule. This one will relax the smooth muscle. In this case, it's not. This is the detrusor muscle. When the detrusor muscle contracts, this is going to be what expels the urine out into the urethra for urination. But this individual is having an overactive bladder. We're getting too much urine, okay? Incontinence, overactive bladder. We don't want that. So we're gonna relax the detrusor with a beta-3 agonist. And this is going to help alleviate some of the issue here. Okay, it can also affect and cause dizziness, so be aware of that. The other newer medication is Droxidopa, Northera. This is a drug used for what's called neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Neurogenic neur neurons are dying. Orthostatic hypotension, when you go ortho, meaning you, ortho means straight, so when you stand up, you get dizzy. Normally there'd be negative feedback mechanisms to kick in, 
So when you stand up, all that gravity is now going to pull the blood away from your brain. Okay, and negative feedback would kick in to increase heart rate and cause vasoconstriction to send the blood back up. But that doesn't work very well because you have something like Parkinson's where neurons are dying. You can't do the negative feedback. So these neurons are adrenergic neurons. You don't have as much norepinephrine. So to replace some of that norepinephrine, you can give droxydopa, which is converted into norepinephrine, so we replace some of that norepinephrine to compensate for the neurons that are dying. And this can help with the, what's called neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Now onto alpha blockers. We covered alpha adrenergics, which were alpha one agonists. So alpha blockers are alpha one antagonists. I'm gonna do the opposite. Okay, these often end in osin, which can give you a hint. So if I asked you, if it ends in osin, what drug category would that be? You wanna put alpha blocker or alpha one antagonist. Okay, what can these be used for? BPH, things like Flomax, maximum flow. Remember with BPH, they can't urinate very well. Okay, so, you want to increase that flow also. So that's through the urethra. Also, it'll, it'll open up the ureter. So if there's a kidney stone stuck in the ureter, it can help dilate that to help passage of the kidney stone. Why hypertension? Remember the predominant adrenergic receptor located on the vessels is alpha one. If you block that, it's going to cause vasodilation. And that's going to decrease peripheral resistance to lower blood pressure. Raynaud's disease, there's a couple of forms of Raynaud's disease, but one of them is if you have excess sympathetic output. Remember, the sympathetic innervates your vessels. If you have too much sympathetic output, but you're going to get vasoconstriction, cutting off the blood supply to your fingers and your toes. And they get tingling and numb numbness, and they can even turn blue. And if they're really bad, you could get ischemia and possibly gangrene. So this is gonna be an alpha blocker to block that vasoconstriction to give you again vasodilation. Theochromocytoma is when you have a tumor in the adrenal medulla. This is gonna release a lot of epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood causing elevated blood pressure. Now they're gonna do surgery, but before they do surgery, they need something to lower the blood pressure. So they can give an alpha blocker. ADRs should make sense. Okay, remember there's alpha one on the dilator pupillate. If you block that, you're gonna get the opposite effect. This is an antagonist, right? Don't forget it's an antagonist. You get meiosis, nasal congestion, because you're causing vasodilation instead of vasoconstriction. Orthostatic hypotension, okay? It's gonna block some of the negative feedback. So it's going to blunt your ability. It's going to cause vasodilation, right? It's going to blunt your ability to increase your blood pressure upon standing. So it takes a few more heartbeats. And in the meantime, you're going to get a little bit dizzy. And this happens especially in the first doses. Eventually, you get more used to it. And that effect tends to, be, tends to go away. Beta blockers now. We went through the beta agonist. What was the prototypical beta agonist? That was epinephrine. Now we're on blockers or beta antagonist. Now these are used to decrease cardiac output, decrease heart rate, stroke volume, so you can be used to lower blood pressure. With heart failure, a lot of times you get reflex tachycardia. Your heart is not very efficient. So your, your brain tells your heart to beat faster and it increases the workload, which is not the best. It's like flogging an already overloaded donkey carrying your supplies. You're gonna hurt the donkey, he's overloaded. 
if you tell the heart to beat too hard and it's already having a hard time, you could damage it. Okay, arrhythmias usually increase heart rate, right? So you're gonna decrease, increase heart rate. Angina, chest pain from not, your, your heart is not getting enough oxygen. So by giving a beta blocker, you decrease cardiac output. So you decrease the oxygen requirement for the heart. So it can be used to alleviate or decrease the episodes of angina. After a heart attack, part of your heart has died. So it, it's not as efficient. So tachycardia again, we need to block that. So a lot of times after an MI, they'll, they'll give for for a while, they'll give you a beta block. So you, you blunt the reflex tachycardia that could you need to, to give the heart a chance to rest and repair itself. Migraine prevention. Okay, now this one would be if you block a non-selective beta blocker. What does that mean? That means it's a beta blocker that blocks both beta one and beta two. Okay, remember we said that there are also, remember it's mostly alpha one, but there's also beta two in the vessels. So migraines are associated with excessive vasodilation of the cerebral arteries. So this beta two blocking of beta two is gonna give you a little bit of vasoconstriction to prevent the number of episodes of migraines that you have. Remember migraines are vasodilation. It's gonna cause a little bit of vasoconstriction. Glaucoma, there's a eye drop called Timoptic, Timolol, which can be used to, it'll go bind to the beta-1 receptors on the ciliary body epithelial cells to decrease production of aqueous humor. Can be used to lower intraocular pressure. Okay, as we mentioned, there's non-selective beta blockers and selective. So timolol and propanolol, non-selective, whereas selective would be metoprolol and atenolol. Okay, so we mentioned the timolol or tip, timoptic can be used to decrease aqueous humor production, thus used for glaucoma. Elevated glaucoma is elevated intraocular pr ocular pressure. Okay, why this one's very important. Why would you not want to use a non-selective in an asthmatic patient, you're gonna bl block both beta one and beta two. If you block beta two, what are you gonna get? Bronchoconstriction. Do you think that that's gonna help an asthmatic patient? No, no, no. So don't cause bronchoconstriction by giving a non-selective beta blocker to an asthmatic patient. Say they have high blood pressure, but also asthma. You'd wanna use a selective like metoprolol or atenolol. Okay, review anaphylaxis was epinephrine. BPH was alpha blockers. What causes bronchodilation? That would be the beta-2 selective agonists like albuterol and terbutaline. Glaucoma, that was the timoptic beta blocker. Also the alpha-2 blocker, or alpha-2 agonist, not blocker, alpha-2 agonist, which will decrease norepinephrine. That was called bromonidine, alpha-GAN-P, which was used for hypertension. We could use beta blockers to de decrease cardiac output. We could also use alpha blockers. It would cause vasodilation to decrease systemic vascular resistance. Here's a question for you. And we said it was B. Here's another question. Phenylephrine, what class does it fall under? Anyone remember? Alpha adrenergic or an alpha one agonist. None of these are right, except for this one is the best answer. Alpha agonist will actually cause vasoconstriction, not dilation. Okay, blocking or decreasing sympathetic would be sympatholytic. The opposite of a sympatholytic would be sympathomimetic. 
decreased production of aqueous humor. Alpha agonists, that's gonna increase blood pressure, we know that. We know there's alpha-1 receptors on the dilator pupillae, so it's gonna cause medriasis. These things are the same, these are the same things, so we know that those aren't right. Moving on to the parasympathetic side of the drugs, we covered the sympathetic, right? Alpha adrenergics, alpha blockers, beta adrenergics, like epinephrine, and then beta blockers. Now we're on parasympathetic. So we have cholinergics and anticholinesterases, and then the anticholinergics or the muscarinic antagonists. Okay, brief review. Remember that we have muscarinic receptors located on effectors. Here's the effector. What would the effector be? It's going to be smooth muscle, cardiac, or glands. These are the effectors that are innervated by the parasympathetic, things you don't have control over. Okay, so we have muscarinic, that's what we're talking about. So if you see cholinergic drug, the cholinergic drug would imply that it's activating the muscarinic. I know that these are also right here. Muscarinic, the nicotinic receptors are as well, but we're gonna focus our attention on the most clinically relevant cholinergic receptors, the muscarinic. Okay, so you have direct or indirect, direct or indirect cholinergics. Okay, this is maybe a little confusing the first time you see it, but a direct cholinergic is going to be a muscarinic agonist. Don't forget that. Indirect is going to be an anticholinesterase, aka acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. inhibitor. Okay, maybe we need to review what that was. Here it is. Acetylcholinesterase with something that will break down. Doesn't have to necessarily be just the neuromuscular junction. Could be the neuroeffector junction. Don't remember what the neuroeffector junction means. Let's go back to our figure here. Here is the neuroeffector junction. Okay, parasympathetic. There's acetylcholinesterase in there as well. Okay, here's the acetylcholinesterase, this little thing, this triangle thing. That is going to break down the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So what if you inhibited this though? If you inhibited the thing that breaks down acetylcholine, acetylcholine levels go up even more to stimulate the muscarinic receptor even more. Now the muscarinic receptor is not in the neuromuscular junction, but it's in the neuroeffector junction. If you stimulate that even more, you're gonna have even more activity, cholinergic activity, okay? So the question for you is, do you understand why an indirect cholinergic, an indirect, an anticholinesterase is has a cholinergic effect. If you see cholinergic, that means it acts like the parasympathetic. It acts like the parasympathetic. Okay, on to the direct cholinergics. This means muscarinic, actually direct or indirect. So both muscarinic agonist and a acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Either one of those is gonna have the same effect. Act like parasympathetic. It's going to increase all your secretions, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, cramps. It's going to increase gut motility. Remember rest and digest? Increase gut motility. One of the neurotransmitters is acetylcholine. If it goes up, it's going to cause more nausea and vomiting. It's one of the five neurotransmitters. If it goes up, it's going to make you nauseous. So these drugs make acetylcholine go up or the effects of acetylcholine go up. So it gives you emesis. You can also use dumbbells if you want. Either acronym helps you remember what the cholinergics do. But what could they be used for? Glaucoma, we'll go through it, but it actually, 
but actually let's hold off on this. This is a summary. I'm gonna explain each one. So let's start with glaucoma. Normal flow of aqueous humor is gonna be the ciliary body epithelial cells. Here they are making aqueous humor. It's gonna drain out through the canal schlem. Okay, so remember that. Notice that if the iris is flat here, it's flat, nice and flat, it can drain out better. Okay. Now, open angle glaucoma is just in reference to the trabecular meshwork being congested. That's what can happen. So notice the iris is flat. The iris is flat when you have meiosis. <clears throat> Does a cholinergic cause meiosis? Yes. So it will, the point of it is, it will drain out better when the iris is flat. If you have medriasis, notice that it's blocked off. So medriasis blocks it off. Medriasis. Okay. So the question for you is, if you have a drug that causes medriasis, does that help glaucoma? Absolutely not. You want a drug that causes meiosis, cholinergic. That's why it said over here, it can be used for glaucoma. It helps with the drainage of aqueous humor. Increase drainage. Okay, we mentioned this already, but now we, the muscarinic, I, I did put it on there, I think. But remember muscarinic, located on the ciliary body muscles, these smooth muscles is gonna cause, it's gonna cause contraction which moves it closer. So there's no tension, decreases tension, causing it to be spherical for near vision. And then again, we said muscarinic sphincter pupillae causes meiosis, meiosis, pupillary constriction. And we said that this favors drainage, so it can be used for glaucoma. Next one is myasthenia gravis, okay, next indication. Now, myasthenia gravis is when you get autoantibodies, antibodies that your own body makes and comes and destroys your NM or N1 receptors. If you destroy those, do you think, what kind of symptoms would you get? Here's the neuromuscular junction. You don't have any N1 receptors, probably muscle weakness. So to compensate for, the, for that, you can inhibit this enzyme, the acetylcholinesterase, making the acetylcholine go up to compensate for the fact that you have less receptors. So pyridostigmine would be a, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor or anticholinesterase, which would increase the amount of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction to help with the muscle weakness. So you can stimulate these, these few that you have available because a lot of them were destroyed by the autoimmune disease. Anticholinesterases. So they can also be used to increase acetylcholine in the brain. Now with, with um, disorders like uh, any dementia, um, Alzheimer's disease, you're gonna have decreased acetylcholine. If you have decreased acetylcholine because of these dis diseases, you're destroying, in these diseases, you're destroying your cholinergic neurons. Cholinergic neurons are very important for learning and memory, okay? To help compensate for the loss, learning and memory, you're destroying those with dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, you can increase the amount of acetylcholine though to compensate and help increase that by giving an anticholinesterase like, like Aricept that goes to the brain. Okay, so I'll give you, I'll give you one. And a, lot of, a lot of students like to take Benadryl to help them sleep. Benadryl is an antihistamine, but guess what? Benadryl also has anticholinergic properties so notice when you wake up the next morning, anticholinergic makes you, your mouth dry. It's gonna dry everything out. 
but it all also can affect your ability to think and it decrease anticholinergic. So don't take it before an exam, the day before an exam. You might have some residual effects there. It might compromise your ability to think on an exam, but do get a good night's sleep. Okay, irreversible inhibitors of anticholinesterase. These would be poisons. Malathion, these are organophosphates. They could use these to spray fruit trees. And then they, the apples don't get worms, stuff like that. In the gas chamber, sarin nerve gas. Now, if a person was exposed to some fruit tree spray, like malathion or parathion, what would they come to the ER? Would they have, they'd be really slimy, right? Because it'd be cholinergic activity, excess cholinergic activity. These are indirect, indirect cholinergics. So they'd be really slimy. It'd be salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, a lot of that going on on the ER table. Okay. Uh, what else? It might compromise their ability to breathe, right? Too much acetylcholine. You're going to be contracting that diaphragm a lot. Okay, excessive. And you won't be able to alternatively relax it, which is necessary for breathing. Now, I mentioned all of this uh, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation. Okay, that's, that can help you remember some of these things. And we said one of the five neurotransmitters that if they go up, we'll get, we'll talk about more of those later. But one of them is acetylcholine. Diarrhea, increased gut motility. Remember these act like parasympathetic. Okay, you're gonna be, um, for distant vision, you'll be able to see, okay, close up because parasympathetic is for close up. But far away, it'll be blurry. Excess sweating. Remember, um, sweat glands are innervated by the sympathetic, but generalized sweat glands have muscarinic receptors. Okay, that was the exception to the rule. So you're going to be sweating a lot. Tremors because of the excess activity of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction. To, ca to cause muscle contraction. Bronchoconstriction, remember parasympathetic, it's gonna cause bronchoconstriction. Remember sympathetic if you're being chased by a bear when you like to have a lot? Remember parasympathetic's the opposite. It's gonna cause bronchoconstriction. Decrease heart rate. There, there are muscarinic receptors on the autorhythmic cells to decrease heart rate. Hypotension is going to decrease heart rate to lower your blood pressure. Anticholinergics. These are the muscarinic antagonists. Okay, these are going to be the opposite now. We're moving on here. Here are the drugs that you have to know. Recognize these as being anticholinergics. And we'll mention the toxins. I'll show you some pictures of those. Okay, a lot of times they, they might give these preoperatively because the general anesthetics cause a lot of secretions. These dry things up, they're the opposite. Okay, they're the opposite of the cholinergics. So Benadryl, we mentioned, has anti-cholinergic properties. That's why it makes your mouth dry. Okay, even though it's an antihistamine. Cardiac arrest, what does an anti-cholinergic do to your heart rate? Increases it, it's doing the opposite of parasympathetic. Okay. Nausea and vomiting. We said too much acetylcholine causes nausea and vomiting. This is going to block that effect. Ulcers, you decrease production of acid. It's going to open up the airways. Overactive bladder. Your, your, your bladder is overactive. We can block that effect with, an, with a muscarinic antagonist. Irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea, a lot of diarrhea, it's gonna block that. It's gonna dry you up, makes you so you, you can't defecate. So glycopyrrolate, Robinol will do that. Motion sickness, we mentioned. We mentioned that already up here. Okay, antiemetic, something that makes you not throw up. Don't use in glaucoma patients, why? Does this cause medriasis or meiosis? These cause 
medriasis, and they would block the drainage of aqueous humor, which would further increase intraocular pressure. So you never use these with glaucoma patients. Okay, so here are the plants that these came from. Belladonna means beautiful woman. So a long, long time ago, they thought they could give some of this deadly nightshade as an eye drop and cause the pupils of prostitutes to dilate. And they thought that was beautiful. So that's where that comes from, belladonna. But it is deadly, anticholinergic. It can mess with your heart, right? Would in increase your heart rate and force of contraction, not so good. Now, here's another one, Angel's Trumpet. This is a lot in Ecuador. When we were on a trip in Ecuador, we did see this. What would, I, what would happen to me if I would have nibbled on, on some of this? Would I have been, had a lot of secretions or a few secretions? Would my mouth be dry? Yes. What would be my heart rate? Increased. So for anticholinergic, it's the opposite. You're going to be really dry, excessively dry, as opposed to to all those secretions with the cholinergic overdose. Can't see, can't pee, can't spit, can't defecate. Now these are important body functions. Would it make you sad if you couldn't do these things? Yes, but too bad, you can't even cry about it because you can't produce tears. You can't lacrimate. This is fairly easy after going through that, right? That would be anti-cholinergic. Okay. Nurses giving bethanicol. You remember what bethanicol was? You want to know what drug class it was? Does anyone know what drug class bethanicol was? Bethanicol was a muscarinic agonist. Knowing that, what do you think it does? You know, it increases secretions. It's going to increase your ability to make acid. You wouldn't want to do that with an ulcer. 